right, we're going to get started and hopefully some more people will trickle in. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we want to take a few minutes to explain what's happening tonight and what the next steps are. Tonight at the request of the RBO Objective 8, which is the Training Programs Committee, Cynthia Jeffries and Annie have joined us to present alternative bargaining models. Cynthia and Annie have been working with us over the past year. Cynthia continues to provide input and guidance to us at all of our steering committee meetings and Annie is there at, as well, once a month, and they are both available to us and other members of the RBO team. We're grateful for their continued support as we move forward in our work. So tonight is an opportunity for us to be educated in other models available to us uh, for bargaining a contract. And at the end of the um, meeting tonight, please take a few minutes to fill out that little uh, comment card you received when you came in. And the info you provide will be used um, by the Objective 8 Committee to make a recommendation to the RBO Steering Committee about the model to use in the next bargaining session. Uh, if, if the Objective 8 recommend, uh, group recommends using the alternative model, it will present its recommendation to Anita and the ANESU bargaining groups. If both groups agree at that point to use an alternative method, plans will be made to commit to training and the parties uh, involved will begin their work. So thanks to Objective 8 for organizing this great presentation and to Cindy and Annie for joining us. I'll turn it over to you guys. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, I'm Cynthia. For those of you who haven't met me, this is my colleague, Annie. Um, Annie was not with our office when we um, started this program, gosh, uh, almost a year and a half ago. And um, she came shortly after the RBO was completed with the party, so we started integrating her into the process so that she could get to know you. Um, we're thrilled to be here. Um, hopefully the information that we have to share with you tonight will help you um, make a decision as to how you want to conduct your bargaining sessions going forward. Um, my understanding is, is that you have a two-year agreement, a year of which is already done. That's fairly normal with traditional bargaining because traditional bargaining is generally set up to be um, adversarial. But for those of you who don't know us, we work for an agency of the federal government called Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. We were set up under the Taft-Hartley Act and our sole purpose in existence in this world is to promote labor management, harmony, and peace, and to try to minimize the impact of stock in totality, um, any type of action that would interfere with the free flow of commerce of the United States. Um, primarily, that means strikes, and we hear about them all the time. That's what federal mediators are charged to do. Um, there are no fees for our services for groups like yourselves. Um, sometimes there are fees for service, but that involves only federal um, agencies. So um, all of our everything that we do is is um, we have a, 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 a budget that is submitted to Congress every year. Hopefully it gets approved. It does, um, but it's all part of the overall um, budget of the United States. We are an independent agency, so we report to no one except the President of the United States. Our director reports directly to the President of the United States, and that is um, for the very reason that what we do, when we work with parties, we maintain your confidentiality and we maintain our neutrality. We don't take sides with either party. That's what makes us effective. If we were part of an another federal entity like Department of Education, that might be a perceived compromise of our neutrality. So that's why we are independent. <coughs> we do um, not just collective bargaining mediation, but as this group has experienced, we do a heck of a lot of different types of trainings, education, and assistance to the parties. Um, and basically, we work with the parties, assess what their needs may be, and present what our thoughts are, <coughs> Excuse me, and then that's up to them as to what they're going to do which is what we're going to do tonight. We are going to present a compare and contrast of three different bargaining models that are commonly used in um, school districts, especially these days, 
um, and then the decisions will be yours what you do with it going forward. I will say that this group, and I want to commend this group for the tremendous progress that you have made and the time and commitment that you have put forth since you embarked on this journey. And you all need to be very proud. Things have come a long ways. You still have work to do. Um, this is yet another piece of that puzzle. So with that, um, unless there's any questions about who we are or what we do, we'll go ahead and talk about what the, what, uh, the models are. got a packet of three um, documents and basically these are yours to take home. This PowerPoint presentation that we're going to do, if anybody would like that, if you leave us your email address, we will send it to you. Okay, we just didn't want to you know, kill a lot of trees not knowing how many people would be here or how many would really want to have the PowerPoint with us. The first document that you have outlines the um, basic um, differences and um, entities of the three models we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about traditional gardening, which you are very familiar with because that's what you've always done. We're going to talk about IBB, which is interest-based bargaining. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about another program that, F that is unique to FMCS in the way that we do it. There are other hybrid models out there, but it's called critical issue bargaining. The um, other two documents, these are going to be just some review papers that you can take home and pretty much information is going to be covered in the PowerPoints that we're talking about, okay? So, let's talk about traditional bargaining, okay? Traditional bargaining is set up to have one winner and one loser. I don't care who you are, where you go, that's what it looks like. There is someone who feels, one party feels they won more than the other, and one that feels they lost or gave up more than the other. We hear it every time we go into collective bargaining mediation, we hear that. Well, we have given up on almost everything, and they haven't given up on anything. All right? That's the nature of the beast of traditional bargaining. The settlement generally is perceived to favor one party over another. And um, with, with it, there is a potential for relationship damage. That, again, has to do with the adversarial style that it's set up. With traditional bargaining, there are agendas that people have predetermined. And you do that in your own confines of your own group, and it's not shared with the other side. Okay? So, you know, the, the management team will strategize and set their agenda of what they want, and they will do the same on the union side, but they don't share that strategy, and because that's why we do bargaining chips, okay? It's all about power, all right? So when you come into traditional bargaining, you have unrealistic and inflated bargaining demands and priorities, all right? Um, there's a lot of secrets, evasions, games, who's going to blink first. Um, that's how it has been set up since collective bargaining began. Worked well back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. But then what happens? The world changes. And when the world changes, we have to look at different ways to do things. Traditional bargaining has a very rigid approach and there's typically little room for movement. And you're certainly not going to tell the other side what your room for movement is. That's part of your own strategy. And if you give that up too soon, then you feel like you've lost your power or your ability to obtain what it is you really wanted to have. When I talk about secrets and evasions, it's because you will come into bargaining, one side or the other, sometimes both, will come into bargaining in, in a traditional mode and they will have a list of um, proposals and they're actually demands because of the way they're written um, that can probably fill most of these seats in this one section of an auditorium because it's a wish, wish list and we know we have to have that wish list. In order to whittle it down, we know going into it, 
which of those items we're willing to give up because they're really not important, but there are bargaining chips. Okay, that's traditional bargaining. Um, there's little to no room for problem solving in traditional bargaining for cooperation. In all of this that, we, that I've talked about right now, that all sets the stage for conflict. And I, the um, people who participated in the RBO process, they learned a lot about conflict and what causes it and how to deal with it and what's a better way to approach it. So just, you know, when we talk about traditional bargaining, that stage is set for the conflict. That's the way it is set up. And that is typically the way the majority of people have been taught and practiced collective bargaining. I know I certainly did. I wasn't always a mediator. In my, in my prior life, I was management, and then I was union. So I've been in both seats at that bargaining table. Now I'm at a neutral seat, okay? So I've been there. I've done it. And I knew when I was doing it that there were better ways to do things. So, let's talk about modified traditional bargaining models. First one we're going to talk about is what's known as interest-based problem solving. Now, with the uh, people who attended the RBL, and I know there's a, there's quite a few of you here tonight that did, you learned these components in that. Okay, you learned interest-based problem solving. The steps and techniques are the same in the interest-based problem solving that you are utilizing and practicing at all levels within the schools today. Okay, this is something that has helped and is helping to transform this relationship and bring it back around. So, um, I, I was talking to uh, an individual earlier this evening who said that, you know, Things go along really well, and, and, and it seems like we're really making progress, and then something happens. And my question to this person was, do you deal with it differently now than you did prior to the RBO and learning this interest-based problem solving? And the answer was, absolutely. It's dealt with entirely different. And that's okay, you're always going to have setbacks, you're always going to have disagreements. You're human beings. There's disagreements happen. It's what you do with them and how you handle them. So in the interest space, in a nutshell, it's the same principles as what, what we taught you in the RBO. Um, you're going to be dealing with issues, interests, options, standards, and solutions. Okay? It's, it's, it's five steps. Same as, as uh, excuse me. Same as the interest-based problem solving. Now the principles are also the same. You're going to focus on the issue, not on personalities or the past. It takes that component right out of it. It's uh, then after you focus on what the real issue is, and when we talk about issues, when you come into traditional bargaining, you get a piece of paper handed to you that says. Uh, the association um, proposes, sometimes the word demand is used, um, uh, you know, X amount percentage wage increase. When you, when you use an interest-based problem solving process, that is transformed into a question of what's the real issue, and the real issue is we need a little wage increase, okay? Now you need to figure out what, why do you need that? What are your interests in that? What are your concerns? Because for every issue, there's an interest, but there also is a concern. Because if my issue is, is that, you know, and we agree that the issue is we need to afford, you know, a realistic affordable increase um, for, the, for the, the teachers, for example, there are concerns. Okay, and the first concern that I would think of is, what's your idea of realistic and fair? <laughs> okay, and that's okay, because you need to confront those and you need to understand what each other's concerns, interests, and fears are around those proposals. You don't get that opportunity in traditional bargaining. Those discussions don't take place. Okay, that's not the system. The system here is set up that you have to identify those. You do these in joint sessions, 
you have ground rules. You very seldom, it, you know, most parties will agree that they can take what's known as a caucus in the ground rules, but the caucuses should be limited because both of these processes that we're talking about tonight are meant to be face-to-face, -face, thorough discussion, full transparency, to get to the real issue that addresses what it is we need, why we need it, how can we get there, and then come to consensus on that. That's the IBV process. Information is shared freely and openly, which is not the case in traditional bargaining. I talked to some parties today on my way down here who said, I can't get the other person, you know, the other side to agree to come to the table. They agreed to mediation, but I can't get them to give me a date. And they're saying they're not going to move, it's a waste of time. So my question to, to the person I was speaking to was, have they, have they said why, why this particular, it, it's a scheduling issue, okay, a, a staffing issue, how much staff is going to be at any given point in time. Have they shared to you what their concern is about going to these staffing levels? Nope. Because those discussions don't take place. In interest based in critical issue bargaining, they have to take place. It's part of the process. From there, after you've done your information sharing, um, you will generate options. That's commonly known as brainstorming, okay? And you just throw out every conceivable idea that you can have. And, and then what you do is the next step is you have a predetermined set of standards. We suggest, is it feasible? Is it beneficial? Is it acceptable? Feasible is going to cover things like, is it cost effective? Can we do it? You know, would it fix the problem? Okay. Um, beneficial is sometimes, sometimes resolutions aren't necessarily have like this big, huge, long list of benefits, but they will have a list of, well, it really doesn't hurt anything. So if it doesn't hurt anything, it's still a viable option. Then you use a consensus process after you've used um, the standards to whittle down the options that you've generated as to what could work. Um, in the IBB process, it is a consensus-based process. If you don't reach consensus, you don't have an agreement. Which brings us to the critical issue bargaining. With the critical issue bargaining, it is a hybrid collaborative bargaining model which encourages earlier and full information sharing and problem solving and which provides a built-in transition to traditional bargaining for resolution of unresolved or other critical issues. With interest-based bargaining, there, there really isn't a well-defined transition if the parties decide, you know what, this is just not working, and we can't possibly do this for our bigger issues like, say, wages and benefits. We need to go back to traditional bargaining, which is always in the ground rules that you can. Generally, in the ground rules, you're going to keep any tentative agreements that you've already, you know, agreed upon, and then just simply go back into the traditional mode. You both go your own ways. You split off into your own sides. You caucus independently. You have very little dialogue going forward from that point on. Um, in the critical issue bargaining, because of the way it's set up, and I'm going to walk you through the steps a little bit more defined in this, although this is by no means anywhere near what the full training is. Um, because I think it's important for you to see how that transition and how it prepares you better if you have to go or feel you need to go back into the traditional mode. And that's okay. Okay? I don't want anybody to think that if they try one or the other of these alternative models and they end up going back into traditional at the end, towards the end, in the diff more difficult economics, you don't have to feel that that's, that's a failure or a setback, because it is not. Okay? And the more you practice it, the more proficient you come at it, and it's very common for people to, parties to, kind of feel themselves slipping back to that traditional um, platform at the end. So in the critical issue categories um, of bargaining, you have phase one, which are your less challenging items, but yet they're necessary to resolve, 
okay? You have phase two, which are more challenging, yet necessary to resolve. And phase three, which would be your most challenging and critical to resolve. Okay, so if you notice in the first ones, first two phases, there are necessary items to, to resolve. In the last one, they are critical to resolve. That's more of your economic issues, okay? But nowhere in here, in any of these three phases, does it say, gosh darn it, I wish I'd like to have this, so I'm gonna put it in their category. It doesn't exist. You're gonna to come to the table with really only the issues that you have to resolve. No wish lists. And when you come to the table with them, you don't have the wish list because you're not gonna be using bargaining chips to gain what your agenda is. You're going to use transparency, the sharing of information, and discussion and thorough understanding of what it is that needs to get there, and then you're jointly going to come to a resolution of how to obtain that after you understand each other's issues and concerns. So let's talk about this a little bit more. In the phase one steps, I'm just like throwing everything around. Again, you're going to focus the issue, you're going to write it in, in an issue. An issue statement does not have names, it does not have a resolution, and it is not accusatory. So an issue statement is not that the school boards do this, that, or the other thing, therefore we want this, nor is it you know, well, the unions always had their way, so, we're, you know, we want this back. None of that exists in the issue statement. They're jointly agreed upon and tweaked. You're each going to come to the table with your own issue list, and you'd be surprised how many issues you really have in common when you use a process like this, which is something you never see in traditional bargaining. It's very difficult to figure out if you have any commonality at all. And really you do, you're just approaching it different so it doesn't surface. So you're gonna focus that issue, you're gonna share the in interest. Um, there's no need to categorize interests or mutual or separate. In the IBB process, after you let every, both sides list their, their interests, you then go back and you find the ones that are common. And your best resolutions are going to come around resolutions that focus around those common interests to solve the problem. Because, hey, what happens? You know, everybody's happy. You're both happy. It may not be your best choice, your first choice, or your most desired choice, but you can live with it. Okay? Um, but in this phase of this of the critical issue bargaining, you don't, there's no need to do that categorization of the interests. Again, you're going to brainstorm options, just like you do in IBB. You're going to apply the evaluative standards or criteria, just like you do in IBB. You're going to reach consensus on solution, or you're going to hold it over to phase two or phase three, if it's unresolved. That's the biggest difference. You're using the exact same process, the sharing of information, the full transparency, thorough discussion and understanding in a controlled environment to understand, but you don't have to reach consensus. Remember I said in IBB, if you don't reach consensus, you don't have agreement. And then you just simply poof everything from there on out. Sometimes just kind of goes right downhill and you end up in traditional bargaining and any issues that you hadn't got to, you don't even run the process, okay? Here, you don't, if you don't reach consensus, you don't reach consensus. You hold it over to the next level. Okay? So phase two, again, phase two is the same exact process. Focus the issues that, of these more critical ones that you have identified, okay, the more challenging ones in the phase two. Again, share your interests, interests, uh, issues, concerns, and fears. Consensus-based discussion, if it's feasible, including concept options, 
because here in this space, you don't have to talk in just necessarily outright clear um, uh, resolutions. You could talk in concepts. Okay, well, you know, this is the concept of, gosh, maybe um, forming a uh, healthcare cost containment committee, is that, is that a concept that would be worth flushing out? Okay, so it's a concept. It's not an, a full resolution. So you have that ability to do that in, that in the CIB process. If need be, in light of discussion, you can exchange more realistic written concept proposals and discuss how to move towards resolution. So you can see where it's starting to integrate a little teeny bit of the traditional style here, okay? Because you now are building in, after you've had full discussion, transparency, sharing of information, understanding your, your interests, concerns, and fears, okay? Now, you're in this phase two step, you're building in that ability to, to transform into a written proposal, but in the concept mode, okay? Um, and then you tentatively agree to solutions or you hold it over to phase three. Okay. In phase three, you're talking about the same thing. Focus your issue, share your interests, develop more realistic and evidence-based comprehensive options. Again, this is infiltrating the traditional mode back into the process in a little teeny way. So now you've put two components back in there, but you've done it in a more positive, proactive way. You exchange um, such options, you can use flip charts, uh, other written forms, or uh, via mediated, facilitated proposals, and what ifs. Again, another component of traditional bargaining. Because when you get to the point where you feel that you're at impasse, um, you generally will call in a mediator. And the mediator is then going to start working in proposals and what ifs. But they're going to do it in separate rooms with the parties. All right? If I come in, I'm going to go in and I'm going to meet with the school board team and I'm going to say, tell me what your interests, issues, concerns, and fears are with this particular proposal. We've got to work at it one inch at a time. So once I have a thorough understanding of that, then I can come up and say, well, what if, what if, and I don't know if they would, but what if the association would agree to do this? Does that change your mind, or does that help you think of any additional options? That's what mediators do. That's traditional bargaining, traditional mediation. You see that piece built in here, the ability to do that in option three, if you don't reach consensus. You're always going to try consensus with each of these levels, but if you can't, you've got to fall back in critical issue bargaining. And in the phase three, if you've moved things in, that's when you can, again, in a traditional mode, you, you, some, you know, towards the end of bargaining, you're going to start packaging things, and that's where the true ideas come out and the true um, agendas of each party come out, is when you start to see those package proposals at the end, the must-haves. And then there's a little bit of trading and horse trading there. This sets the stage for that same um, type of thing to, to bargain in the more traditional format and still keep some of the co components. But again, the biggest difference is that transparency, sharing of information, and thorough discussion and understanding. Same principles these people went through in the RBO process. That's working very well for them within their individual schools in between the boards and Anita. Those are the, the three models in a nutshell. Now there are a couple things unique to IBB and critical issue bargaining in your initial process steps. Prior to bargaining, the parties would need to do the following. You need to hold an upfront economic forecast and assumptions discussion. Okay, we need to understand what we're looking at here. That's never done in traditional bargaining. 
Okay. You need um, information exchange and categorize issues. You need to identify the issues that you have and then categorize those in the form of open-ended questions for bargaining. Critical issues are generally those issues that provide job and economic security for employees and the organization as a whole. When we do a traditional bargaining, sometimes it gets lost because of the limited ability to have discussion. It gets lost in the fact that, you know what? There's an economic impact for both sides. Okay? Um, so those are things that you, you would do beforehand. You would get together, you would formulate your list of what your issues are. And it's okay if you can't come you know, with your open-ended questions because in either one of these processes, we're gonna tell you that you need to have a strong facilitator. All right, and the facilitator's role is not to participate in the negotiations, but just to help you stay on process. Okay, and do those, uh, let's just do a timeout here. Seems like you're kind of getting off track here with your discussion. You know, facilitators look for things like if you're slipping back into that traditional mode, if there's some accusations, violating your ground rules, any of those types of things. So facilitators go, can we just have a process check here? And most people, will, they'll correct it themselves. They see immediately what's happened. Okay, so it's just to make sure that you stay in process. A good facilitator does not get involved in your content. That's not the job of a facilitator. Okay? So it might be the critical issue, then you have an action plan. You need to be clear about and committed to the approach or method you will use. It doesn't matter which one you use, but there has to be that commitment. When I first suggested the Relationship by Objective Program, it was one of the first things out of my mouth. No commitment, don't do it. Because you will fail. Um, then you need to finalize your ground rules once you do that. Okay, ground rules. You know, we have multiple templates that we, you know, when, when we're helping the parties set these up, we have multiple templates that we give them with names redacted of the, obviously, various parties. If they hadn't given us permission, we're going to take the names out of it. Um, that help you set it up, because you really do. You need to have, these are your rules. Okay, if you're using IBB, you should be building into your ground rules a component of what happens if we revert to traditional bargaining? Do we throw the baby out with the bathwater of all the tentative agreements we have today, or do we agree that we're going to keep those and just take the outstanding issues back in the traditional mode? Critical issue bargaining is not that, it, it's not an issue because it's got that traditional um, transition already built into it. Those are things. If you're meeting after school or right after school, which school districts and school um, uh, associations have to do, typically. You need to talk about, you know what, we only have so much time because we're not going to get through, you know, all of these issues. We're tired. You don't want to get tired, okay? And you get tired. If you're hungry, you get cranky. So do you, you know, are you going to bring in food? Are you not going to bring in food? How's it going to work? Is one side going to do it? Those are all logistics that you need to work out and they're all identified in your ground rules. Um, you need to share information towards the goal of transparency and communication. You guys have come a long ways with that, and I think you see the benefit of that. You've lived the benefit of that so far. But a, a piece that people tend to forget about this is you need to educate your constituents on the process and keep them informed jointly. If you're going to embark on a different type of bargaining, I mean, it, it, we can provide the training, and we'll train anybody who wants to come to it. But we especially want the marketing teams there, because that's what you're going to do. Okay. So if you elect to do this process, and you elect to have FMCS provide the services for you, for the training and or facilitation, we want the bargaining team there. We'll do the training without a commitment to the process. You just tell us which process you want to be trained on. And then you can decide at the end of that, once you've gone through the full training and you fully understand what the process is, because 
these are just the overviews. This is just a highlight. Okay. The training is much more in depth and gives you hands-on practice. At the end of that, if you're going to move forward, we want to hear that commitment. If you have that commitment and you want us to help you, we'll help you with it. But if we don't hear the commitment, we're going to tell you straight out. If you're him on now, you're not going to make it. You have to be committed. So if you've had the training, and maybe a few community members um, or any other stakeholders in the process elect to attend the meeting, you the training, that's fine, okay? But what about everybody that's not there? Everybody that you represent? School boards, represent the community. Anita, you represent your bargaining unit members. They're not at that training. You've embarked on a new process. You need to let them know. They have a right to understand and know what it is you're doing. Generally, what happens at the end of each one of the sessions, you jointly prepare a statement, okay, that you give out to your parties. It's a joint statement. It shows commitment to the process. You're doing this jointly. You've agreed on, you know, um, several things. It's not going to have a lot of details in it because things could still change and you don't want to set realistic, unrealistic expectations out there by putting, you know, something out there that might change prematurely. So you, you do that jointly. You, you give that communication. You're still going to have your own constituents to talk to, but you do, we strongly recommend that you come out of this, out of each session with a joint statement to give to the parties. Okay? Um, and that's very, very important to keep people informed. So, any questions? Okay, basically is, is the presentation in a nutshell. Um, the last slide is just about the ground rules and facilitation because the, um, we don't recommend, and even Cornell University who also does the same program, by the way, charters a lot, and we don't. <laughs> um, we don't recommend that anybody start this process for the first time, or maybe even the second time through, without a facilitator. Our goal is to get you independent. Our goal all along is to get you independent on, on this relationship, to get it on a stable enough ground that you guys can function without us. Okay. I have already not gone to a couple different steering committee meetings because they're doing fine. Okay. The same thing happens with this. We'll facilitate as long as you need it, as long as you want it. But the goal is, is you can do this. You just need some time to learn it, get accustomed to it, and be comfortable with it. A number of places have done it in Vermont. Um, I recommended several places that I know are fine with us. You know, have given us permission to um, tell parties that they've done it. The city of Burlington. The city of Burlington has done this with all three, with three of their four bigger bargaining units. For three times. And we sent you to uh, Washington Central U32. They've done it for a number of years. They started out with us. They did very well. We stopped going to their meetings. They got a little bit hung up that first time around on wages. We went back in, helped them with one session. Boom, they got it done. And they've been well on their way since. We just went back up and did a refresher for them because some of the team members have changed. Other than that, they functioned totally independently. Yeah, I, my question Here, we have a microphone. Oh, oh, I want to really. Oh. <laughs> I'm like sweating up here. My question is more about, I'm curious about the um, relationship with organizations within the state that have a very vested interest on what we do. So how do we work independently and yet somehow balance that with what the Vermont NDA wants us to be doing or what the VSDA wants us to be doing? We could be working as well as we want to, but they're watching closely and want to make sure that whatever we're doing has, doesn't have a negative impact on where their priorities are. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Uh, you know, it, it's, 
no different country with any of the school districts with the Vermont NEA. Um, U32, uh, uh, they just said, we're doing this. It's what we want to do. Okay. Typically with the Vermont NEA, they don't, um, they don't, well, I'm not ever going to wear, but I could be wrong because they don't do everything. <laughs> Um, typically, they don't send the UBSERV director in until you reach impasse, and then they come in at that point. Prior to that, the school districts are free to, to make their own decisions and come to their own agreement. The UBSERV person comes in at the very end when impasse is declared, because then they need to be, they really need to be involved, because if you end up going to fact-finding, they're going to be the ones that have to present it, and their legal department has to, you know, to vulture them, have to present it, okay? Then when it comes back out of fact finding, if you can't, if you are not in agreement to accept that fact finder's report, you know what the next step is. So they have to be involved at that point. Up until that point, typically not. That doesn't mean that there's no communication between bargaining, you know, between the officers of the bargaining unit and in this particular case, Sean. Um, but in 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 um, all of the areas that I've done it, it's never been a problem because the parties are free to come to their own agreements. Now, there may be some things that might be a little bit more problematic, like you know, choice of healthcare and that kind of stuff. Um, but that's okay. And if they want to come to the session, they can come to the session. Okay. But that's even more reason why you need to have a strong facilitator. Okay? Sometimes parties bring attorneys to this. Sometimes attorneys will sit in on this. I had a uh, school district in uh, uh, Massachusetts that I did this with, and the um, school board said their attorney there. Well, this attorney was very well versed in the interest based problem, you know, problem solving mode and very much engaged and very much committed to it. But again, it, whoever you bring to that table, has to be committed. And that includes your attorneys, and that includes you as um, That kind of was my question is when, from what I understand, when people, when we, even before there is a conversation that begins about negotiating, um, there's a, things that the, that the uh, state un wide union basically doesn't want to have happen, like a conversation about health insurance. Pretty clear, they don't, nobody gets to uh, change health insurance, period. Um, so is that something that would be put on the table for clarity at the beginning of the, of the conversation when we're talking about ground rules and all that? What the state level, um, of union is has said you're not going to do that so you know that's that's the way it is because it feels like um, that we're at a disadvantage at the school board level if um, we don't know that what the what the state is absolutely um, giving us. absolutely that, that that full transparency that I talked about that's a two-way street all right it has to be or it doesn't work and if it is decided that healthcare is off the table, we all know that, you know, we all know what the ACA, I mean, we all know, right, Amy? We all know what the ACA, we don't know 30 seconds from now what's changing in it, okay? And we're federal mediators, we should be knowing these things, but we don't, we don't know them any sooner than you do. Um, but we do know that, you know, we do know the Cadillac tax is pushed off. We do know certain other criteria has been pushed off. We do know that these um, Cadillac plans have to make, these grandfather plans have to make transitions in order to stay in business. If they make them, great. Does that mean they're affordable? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. But if, you, if it's not feasible to change plans for a lot of different reasons, pension's another issue, you know, um, sometimes it's just simply cost prohibitive to change pension plans, okay? Um, and so that's not an option, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other options 
that you could talk about that might be beneficial, but don't harm the plant. Okay? I mentioned earlier, uh, say you decide to have a healthcare cost containment committee. You know, labor management committees are, are play a vital role in relationships and, and uh, the ongoing uh, discussions. Okay? Healthcare cost containment committees can do the same thing. You may not be able to make a change, but you should at least be able to jointly look at why the costs are the way they are. Maybe there are other things you can do. There's a lot of innovative ideas out there that don't change the plan, but incentivize, and I just did this with, with the school district not too far from here, talked about, look, you can't get out of the Beehive plant, okay? That's the way it is. It's not going anywhere. Um, but what if you did a wellness plan? What if you did something that you could work out with Beehive that could actually allow you to give a percentage decrease or something like that, okay? Those types of discussions can and should still take place after the full transparency of you can't change plans. Does that, does that answer your question? Oh. Hi, you. Hi. So I have to admit, you know, I'm kind of going on hearsay and what I've heard, and I don't know if it's actually true, having had nothing to do with negotiations previously. But I have the impression that currently negotiations are between the boards and the union with a little bit of central office, but none of, no real input from principals and that kind of in-between management. And that worries me. That seems like, you know, we're talking about what's happening in the building and they're a crucial part of that. And so I wonder if this is any different. Well, I mean, I think that someday you, you can't tell each other who they're going to have on the team because then, you know, you'd be facing probably some legal actions. Um, so knowing that you can't dictate to the other party who, compri you know, who comprises a team, you can address in your uh, ground rules, for example, okay? the fact of how are we going to get enough information on these critical issues. And maybe if you're doing critical issue bargaining, maybe you just need it for the, the phase three, the most critical, crucial must, that you need that full input. Uh, you jointly can decide how are we going to go about getting that. Sometimes, a lot of times in this process, either one of these processes, uh, IBB or CIB, uh, you will actually decide on subcommittees joint subcommittees that will go out and gather the data. Okay, so maybe they have to go to each principal or each um, bargaining unit. Run, uh, where's Kayla? I don't know what you call them. Kayla, Tom, what do you, whatever you call your stewards or chairs, favorite grievance yeah. chair and all that, right? The building yeah, the building reps. Um, you know, you jointly decide in, in your session what it is you need, how you're going to get it, and who's going to get it. So that's the all-inclusive part of it. And then you send that team out, you simply tackle that issue for that session, you send that team out, their job is to get the data, bring it back and report to the full bargaining teams as to what they found out. And then you use that data to move forward utilizing the steps of the brainstorming or the, uh, of the process itself. Um, so you, you may have indirectly addressed this issue, um, but what I'm wondering is, you know, the rubber really hits the road when it comes to the money, uh -huh. you know, and it seems to me that inevitably things will devolve, even in both of those two options, the alternative options, that there's a probability that things will devolve into the traditional bargaining model. And I'm just wondering if there's anything built into the alternative models 
that will derail the potential for an adversarial or confrontational way of dealing with the money stuff, the money and health. You know. Something's popping me in the eye. Uh, yeah, uh, it's called a facilitator. <laughs> Okay, that, that's a facilitator's job is to control that adversarial environment. And if you do move to traditional bargaining, then the facilitator, it's your choice. All right, it's the party's choice. Do you want that facilitator to just facilitate? Or is it now more prudent for that facilitator to become the mediator? Because you're gonna start caucusing. You're gonna start, you know, making your own plans. So, Generally, the facilitator, if your facilitator can do both roles, okay, that's that easy transition. If not, then you just simply bring in a mediator if that's where you want to go. But that's those people's jobs is to control that. I mean, I mentioned in a controlled environment. That's what I mean by controlled environment. The facilitator controls the process for you to make sure you stay. The mediator controls the confidentiality and the protection of the adversarial piece of it. I'm just wondering if, um, is, if it always has to be subcommittees that go and gather information, or is it possible that um, the group decides to bring experts in? So if it would be the principals or healthcare people, whatever. Absolutely. It's the group's decision. The, the key is, it's a joint decision. No party has the ability to say, no, this is the way we're doing it. That's traditional work. Okay. So yes, you, you do use, quite frequently you will bring in, or can bring in experts. You join to decide who that's going to be, which session you're going to bring them at. The use of experts is actually written into most of the ground rules. Okay. Um, and along those lines, you may sometimes, it may not make sense that it's a union person and a management person who goes out and gets information. Maybe it's something that's readily available in central office that the association bargaining team says, we know that's right, just go get it and it. The key is you make those decisions together based on discussion. One more question. How, um, how often do you guys suggest that the bargaining group meets and then like for how many hours each session? <coughs> well, we don't, we don't necessarily make a, a recommendation on how frequently you meet because we know everybody's schedule is busy, but we will recommend that you don't go weeks on end without meeting, okay? Um, the more frequently you meet, the quicker you're going to get done. We recommend generally about three hours. Okay, four, push it. Okay, four would be max, at least. Here. This is intense work. Right, Don? <laughs> and I'm not easy, so. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm just curious about the facilitating and for example, with U32, uh, how, I mean, you occasionally do this facilitating, or are there other people that are brought in to facilitate uh, at the start of the negotiation? How, did, how does that work? And who did, who did U32 use in that case? Uh, U32 used me. Yeah. It was myself and uh, another mediator out of Portland, Maine, uh, Elaine Temple. Um, Elaine came the first couple sessions, and then it's just quite simply too, too far for her to drive. Especially in the dead of winter and that hill going up to U32, whew, that's a bugger. Um, so, uh, I primarily was their facilitator. Um, but, you know what, it's your choice, you decide who you want. There's facilitators out there, okay? It depends, you know, most of them will charge, some don't. Okay, so those are all decisions that you make. And, and in our, our case, since we, it looks like we'll be needing to start in September, which I can barely believe, but um, that timeline, I would think we would need to get on it fairly soon in terms of taking the initial steps. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, you would definitely have to make your decision as to do you want to proceed with one or the other, or, or maybe even both, but they couldn't be done at the same time. Trainings. Um, decide what you want to do, do the training, then decide is this really what you want to do? Okay, so you need enough time, you, you have to allow yourself enough time to do that. Um, and I know that it's, uh, from working with this group for a year and a half now, I know that, you know, the necessity is, is after school, especially uh, if you want to open it up to, um, you know, anybody in the bargaining unit or a stakeholder or anything like that. So, um, it needs to be after school, which means you're going to be looking at, at best, uh, two four-hour sessions of training at best. I would prefer to have 12, at 12 four hours, 12 hours total, okay? Um, and the difference is, is that the more time that we have, uh, the better off uh, you are as far as us if we're doing it for you. Uh, other people can, you know, they have their own thing to do. Um, but it's, well, from our perspective, the more that we build in actual um, practice of each of the steps, the easier it is for you to grasp and understand. We did the same thing at the RBO, okay? Um, a lot of times what I like to do is take a really simple, easy problem, simple, easy problem that you know would come up that would definitely make your list of something that has to be resolved, okay? Um, and use that as the, as the um, practice problem. And then, poof, guess what? You already solved all your problems by the time you're done with training, okay? Now, one thing I did point out is that in both of these models, these alternative models, we will tell you in training, you will only bring to the table the must-dos, no wish list, okay? I'm um, curious about how groups decide whether to um, pursue the IBB or the interest-based bargaining or critical issues bargaining. On what basis do you recommend people make that decision? Um, the critical issue bargaining isn't something that we've had out there for a real long period of time. That's something that a couple of us mediators developed about four years ago, recognizing, that, you know, there's really a piece missing here in the IBB, okay? Um, these, we see these people struggle, and there's a piece missing. So that's when we came up with this critical issue concept. I would say for a group of knowing this group intimately like I do, I would say you would lean more towards the critical issue bargaining. And the only reason I would say that is because you've made such great progress. And part of, in this all was going on in the face of these protracted, traditional bargaining that was going on, and you still did it. You did it within your buildings, okay? But I would hate to see any type of um, major setback in a relationship um, by not having that protection, giving that support and protection. So that's why I would say probably the critical issue bargaining. If we make recommendations, it's on an individual basis. We don't recommend one or the other as a rule. It's based on what we know about the parties. Any other questions? Well, yes. I guess just, I mean, talking about the critical issue bargaining with the built-in, um, the built-in sort of transition or reversion to traditional bargaining, wouldn't that seem like a failure? I'm going to pose that back to you. Why? I mean, if, if, if the idea is to really um, have a frank and full discussion that is, at its basis, non-adversarial, 
as much as possible. It seems like slip sliding back into the traditional bargaining posture, I don't know, it just seems uh, contrary to the whole idea. Remember the slide that we had uh, earlier? Um, let's see. That one. We talk about un inflated, unrealistic bargaining demands and priorities. We took that component out just simply by working the CIB process before you get to that point where you, where you uh, would transition. So we took that out. Secrets, evasions, games, who will blink first? We took that out. Okay, the process is built so that it can't happen. Um, rigid approach, little room for movement. Again, you know, that, that, that component's been removed because you've had the discussions, you've shared information, you've jointly got it, obtained that information, you have a thorough understanding of it. Okay? Um, Little to no room for problem solving or for cooperation. Again, you took that component of conflict right out of there. So if you do end up in traditional, your components for conflict don't exist. It just simply means at this point, instead of working in, because you're still going to try to come to consensus on each of those issues, even in CIB. And it's only going to be those that you can't find your way clear on consensus, and that's okay, because there are hard issues. That's okay. Those are going to be the ones that go into the traditional mode, and by that, because all of your conflict steps have been removed, those trigger points, and when you look at a conflict iceberg, typically when we're in conflict, where our brain just like focuses on that piece, piece that's sticking out of the water, and there's all of this below the water that's really causing the waves, you've gotten to that because you, you've developed it, you've discussed it. So that's all become clear. So really all that's left of the traditional process is formal written proposals. Okay? Which you're gonna go back and forth, give and take, maybe, maybe not. Okay? If you need to have um, you know, the supposal mode of the mediator is there to help. Okay, suppose you did this. I'm not going to say how they're going to react, but suppose you did this. You know, we're looking in from the balcony. So we see things you don't see. Okay, because we, we're not invested in it. We, we don't have a stake in it. It makes no difference to us. We don't have to live with it. So we look at it a little differently. Um, so we've removed those components. And so really all you're dealing with is traditional formatted written proposals, caucuses that happen that aren't going to happen in you know, the rest of the process. You're going to be allowed to strategize. You're going to be allowed to talk to the mediator in private and confidence. Okay? And you're just going to work with that non-confrontational piece of the system. So we've got lots of things that are set to change here in education and from the governance system all the way up through um, conversation about individualized learning. And there's a thousand things uh, change. And one of the things that the boards have to think about is change in the, the way the days are set up um, and kind of big picture how do we do this? How do we accomplish, get this accomplished? And where does that fit into that? Because that is a opposite of status quo, mm -hmm. which honestly it always feels like with our bloated, crazy contract that we have here in this district, that even though it may appear on some level that it's a wish list. It's not a wish list. It's things that we really need to figure out how to change and adjust to from everything from uh, numbers of students, uh, the student to teacher ratios, the how, how the days look for kids, um, all of those things. And I don't see where this fits into that. This, I can see where this can be 
a conversation about um, salary and benefits, but I don't see where we get that big picture um, thing to work. And I feel like that's such a critical piece that has been missing from everything that we've done so far, um, whether in negotiations or anywhere. But in any case, that's my question. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by this bloated contract. I'm not sure what that means. I just mean that. Is it what I mean is, is this contract just keeps getting added to and added to and added to? It's contracts. So. Right, but there's no like, there's no, there's agreements in there that were made, you know, ages ago, that if we were to start with a brand new contract now, I think there would be differences in the way that we would that it would get approached, um, and maybe should be different, but. Well, I, and, I, and I think it's a confusing contract, frankly. When you read it, it's very confusing. I, I just think that it's, 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 it's a contract, tough one. Contracts are geared that way. I mean, there's no way that you can write language that every single person that picks that up reads it is going to interpret it the same way. It's never going to happen. Okay, so that's always going to be problematic. All right. In respect to these changes that you have to make, and how does it fit into this process? Again, we know there are changes. All right? We don't know necessarily on each and every one of them all of the details or the exact criteria and parameter and when. If, it's, if, it, if you know positively it's something that's going to have to be done during the life of the contract that you're dealing with, then yeah, you need to work out the details in that. Aside from that, we see all the time, I mentioned labor management committees. Labor management committees are not to further negotiations as far as changing what you agreed upon and ratified. But they are meant to have those continuing discussions open in the same format as what this process does. All right? So that by the time it rolls around and you need to make the change, look, whether you're in an open contract or not, if you're compelled by the government to do something, you have to do it. You still have to bargain it with that union. Okay? So whether it's during open contract time or it's mid-contract negotiations when the time frames fall, why couldn't you use the same process for a thorough understanding? This is all geared towards the more I know, I have to make change. How many in here like change? Okay, so we got one, yay, and two, and the rest are like, uh-uh. Okay? Change is hard. Now, if I were to ask you on any given topic of change, why you don't want that change, you're going to do what? You're going to tell me your interests, your concerns, your fears. Is that not what this process is for? So once you understand, you have to make the change, but you have to understand why people are fearful, concerned, or on board with it, okay? And the only way you can do that is to have these types of discussions. Does that answer your question, or? I'm just wondering how comparables come into play, if at all, with the other two party methods, comparables. Uh, I'm not understanding. Can you? Yeah, um, for instance, the association will give us a comparable for a certain benefit. And they'll say, well, you know, Addison Southeast mm. is this. Okay, uh huh. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, wages in Chittenden County are this, that kind of thing. Does that come into play in any of these other models? It, it can. It's, it's information that you would need to know, but in traditional bargaining, when one side or the other presents their evidence-based information, so frequently we hear, we don't trust that. We don't believe that. 
So, yeah, it's all information. It's out there. You want to stay competitive, but you also got to be cognizant of your budget. Okay? This process gives you the opportunity to then say, and by the way, this works on both sides because they see school districts that do salary surveys. Well, in this process, you got to put the proof, you know, <laughs> proof is in the pudding. And it does not lend itself to just saying, well, we can't tell you where we got that. Oh, then don't bring it. Okay? Because it has to be verifiable. Now, a lot of times with other contracts, yeah, maybe Edison, you know, Sophie's got, I don't know, 4%, maybe. Okay? How about South Burlington got 4%? Um, what else was in that package? Because it's not just about that single number. Okay, what is the cost share on health care? What is their sick time? What is the, you have the ability to look at the whole package. And you say, you know what, that's great. Let's take a look at the rest of the benefits. But by the way, the association is going to do the same too. Where did you get the information on that survey? We want your sources and we want to know what else is involved in that. Then you got to go get that. So, it's evidence-based, and it's total transparency. Trust takes forever to build. It's broken in the blink of an eye. Okay, and once it's broken, it takes a lot longer to rebuild. And so that's why we frequently hear, we often hear from places I've heard it here. Okay, we all know, we've talked about this. Okay, the trust is starting to come back. And people are feeling pretty good. Okay? So we gotta continue that path. Before you get to my question, you did have a slide that talked about starting with the economic forecast. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, it would be a sharing uh, and understanding of, you know, what is it we're we're looking at here with our economics, with our budget. Okay, here's our costs, here's where we are. You know, typically when we exchange look at budgets, and I, I, you know, I'm guilty of this myself, both from a management perspective and a union, you know, representative, I'm guilty of it. It's like, you know, here's my budget, here's my line item, and oh yeah, and this line item falls all of these things, but I can't separate them all. Yes, you can. Okay? And we have to understand What's the piece of the pie that we have to work with here? And that's a piece of the discussion that generally does not take place in traditional bargaining. There's a lot of dancing around that, and y'all could, you know, the parties I think could be great candidates on dancing at the starts. The dance that's done around that piece of the pie, okay? But if I don't know how much money I have to spend on an evening gown, how the heck can I go buy it? Because it's not just my evening gown. I need shoes, I need a purse, I need earrings, I need a necklace, okay? I need a hairdo, because it's all about me, okay? So I need to understand all of that. And so that's what that economic forecast is about. It's that complete, thorough, transparent, sharing, understanding of what are we dealing with here? relationship 
What's going to be the, could be the first thought? I'm not saying that's true here, but I'm just saying this can, this is a risk. All right? I'm going to believe you're paying him. He's going to say what you want him to say. So what are other options and what are other ways that you could do that? Hey, you could present it openly and honestly. Okay, recognizing they may have questions. Then you find the answers to the questions. Okay? That's one option, but there's lots of options. And so that's why I say, I don't think that that would be a discussion that you would have. And by the way, I think you guys are doing great. So these are just examples from real life experiences that we've had, not necessarily you guys. So to get to the economic question, there's a third party that sits at this table that doesn't have anybody there for them, and that's the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And the taxpayer doesn't want more and more money taken out of their out of their source of funds. Right. It's not an infinite amount of money that we can take from. Mm -hmm. So, thinking that we can continue to do two and a half percent increases on budgets across the board when taxpayers have been saying very adamantly that they cannot sustain those, sustain those kinds of increases. If you come into a bargaining situation saying, we're level funding everything, there's zero percent increase to your budget because we can't do it because you don't know what the state's gonna do either, so that doesn't help. But anyway, um, you only have a finite amount of money. And how do you get both parties to agree that, um, I'm blanking on the word, but a appropriate budgeting is a good thing. Um, because the taxpayers just, they're not able to afford it anymore and it's getting harder and harder. Are they not taxpayers too? Yes. Okay. Uh, and that, that's, that's a typical scenario. You know, if, if it comes in that the budget is, doesn't have any increases, it doesn't have any increases, but that's important information to know and understand. And so what does that mean? Well, all right, sometimes we have to make tough decisions, all right? And sometimes we need to figure out how we're gonna make it work. And that's why we think that this process is more in tune with that, especially as building a relationship and maintaining one is because those in-depth conversations take place and the budget in totality gets looked at, okay? That doesn't mean that at some point that contract might come back and there is increased spending. That doesn't mean that that couldn't happen. But what it does mean is that they're more cognizant of where they need to cut corners, where they need to move things around, and how they need to massage things, all right, to minimize that or eliminate it, depending on the case. It's hard to say. Now, when we're talking about contract negotiations or any type of negotiations, it, it very much comes down to what our, our the risk versus options and benefits, okay? And sometimes those final agreements will come back where there is a certain amount of increased spending. Then people have to decide, all right, can I live with that as opposed to 15, 20 thousand dollars that needs to be spent on fact finding. All right, it comes back as a recommendation and nobody's bound to, okay? And if the fact finders report after spending that 15 to 20 thousand dollars, which is, I get it, it's a sure to cost, but you know what? If I gotta spend 10 thousand dollars out of my money and the union out of theirs, because I, I gotta have this recommendation, because that's what statute says, okay? Uh, I don't have to like that decision when it comes back, right? 
So I, as a school board, can say, no, we reject the fact finders and we're going to impose. Well, you do that and you know what's going to happen for sure then. You're going to get a strike notice. Okay, then you talk about costs of all of that. All right, so that's what I'm talking about, risks versus options. And these sometimes are hard decisions to make, but you have to decide in, in some cases what's the best alternative to no agreement, okay? Or what's the best alternative to no negotiated agreement? Because for every decision that we make, there's consequences when we get to that point. And so, those are sometimes tough decisions. Can I say that this process is going to guarantee that if you say level funding, it's going to be level funding? I can't guarantee that. But I will say that it does make the parties thoroughly understand where the money's at. And I've seen groups time after time after time. I've not yet had a group say, we don't care about that. Okay, because if that's the mode they're in, we're done, rather. Just go right on back to your traditional bargaining. Because that's not the proper mindset. Bring this together, we need to try to figure this out. I'm curious, <clears throat> you probably know we have a new superintendent who's going to be starting July 1st. And I'm curious about um, what role the superintendent plays in either IBB or CIB, or, or what you recommend about that, or what you've seen work the best about that. Um, in the majority of the cases in the school district, the superintendent is there as part of the process. You know, but again, those are your individual decisions. Any other, any other questions? Okay, um, the, um, and I actually fixed this, I don't know what was wrong with me when I was doing this yesterday, but I put, we said anybody who wants these slides can let Dawn or someone know your email address or just slip it to me and I'll be happy to email it to you. But that is Annie's and my contact information. For whatever reason, yesterday I put down some erroneous phone numbers, and if you called me, you would have got her, and if you called her, you got our fax machine. I don't know where it was. So I did fix that on here. Um, we'll be, if you think of questions after the fact, we'd be more than happy to answer those questions. So. Oh, we went out of presentation. Um, all right, well, I thank you very much for your time. And, yes. Sorry, I just to, to know what happens now. I mean, who makes a decision? Is there a joint decision? I mean, so, um, the next steps are um, the objective eight, and the co chairs of that work group are Tori and Tom. They're going to collect the comment cards. Um, they, the objective eight group may meet again to decide, you know, do we uh, let everybody know that it's been recorded and they can watch the recording or the group will meet and decide what, what they'll do about this information, but they'll compile the information gathered on the feedback card and they're gonna make a recommendation to the RBO steering committee about their plan. The steering committee's then gonna look at the plan and say, Yep, that's great. Go ahead. And then it's up to them to reach out to ANESU and Anita and and share the recommendation with them. Then then each group will take the information, the recommendation, go back to their parties, get some word from them, and then make a decision that way. So um, you know, then then the bargaining in the process I I believe the boards will be appointing bargaining members again, I, just as I assume Anita would be doing, Tom's nodding. They'll be, and then 
uh, if the decision is, if there's an agreement between the two sides or two groups that, yes, we want to go with CIB, then somebody will contact Cynthia to, to arrange training and the training will start and then, then those groups that take the training begin, if I understand correct from Cynthia, then they begin to set the, the plan for what goes from there. I don't know if Tom or Tori want to speak to it. I, I think the hope that it, is that a decision will be made, whether or not they go forward or not. Okay, so if everybody will fill out their comment card and leave it on the back table what's wrong right there, we'll grab it on the way. And um, you can let other members know that we were able to get Meet TV here, so they recorded it, so at some point, it'll be available for viewing and they can hear the presentation, all members and community members included. Okay, all right, thanks so much for coming. Thank you.